Thank you, Jenna. That was beautiful. Um, between the prelude songs, the other songs, and of course, God is, that really captured the whole meaning of the message today. All we really had to do was listen to the music, and I wouldn't have to get up and talk. <laughs> Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to those who are watching on YouTube. Uh, thank you for watching, and thank you for being here, coming out on this beautiful, beautiful Alaskan day. <laughs> the title of my talk today is Thoughts Become Things, and my three major points today are pay attention to what is, Say what you believe and believe what you say, and what limits us are our beliefs. First of all, pay attention to what is. What is is God is all there is. It's just right out of that prelude song we had, God is, I am. Um, God is all there is. There is no duality. There is no God, devil, or heaven, hell. I refer back to our sacred reading. I hope I have it. We must instill into the mind the fundamental proposition that good is without bounds. Only good and loving kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. We must get this concept. Rather than continuing to think that there is a power of evil as opposed to the power of good. We experience good and evil because we perceive a presence of duality rather than that of unity. That is one of the fundamental questions that we have sometimes one of the things that are hardest for our students in foundations class to to really get their arms around and one story that I use to illustrate it and it's an old old story and we won't bother with the fact that Snopes has totally discounted it <laughs> this is another one of those things where it doesn't make any difference if it's true or factual or not the thing that's important is the story itself. And this story has a lot of different versions, but one of them is the uh, arrogant um, philosophy professor in front of his, his philosophy class, and he is uh, instructing them and trying how to think and how to reason and whatnot. And his uh, position is that there is no such thing as God, and if there is, that God is evil. And he uses a series of uh, deductive reasonings to show them that since uh, there is evil in the world, there is all these nasty things that are going on in the world, that, and that God made all of everything, that means that God made all of the bad things that are going on in the world, and since we are defined by our actions, then God must be evil or God doesn't exist. And the story continues with a young man that stands up and asks the professor if he can ask a question, and the professor says, well, of course. And he says, well, sir, is there such a thing as cold? Uh, professor, what kind of a question is that? And the class snickers and said, well, of course there's cold. All you have to do is go out in a Alaskan winter and you know there's cold. Well, but sir, that's really not exactly the truth because we know from the laws of thermodynamics and whatnot that um, cold is really just the absence of heat, that we measure everything in heat and uh, the energy that is given off by it, and we go back less and less and less and less heat until we get to minus 458 degrees Celsius, at which time you know everything stops, absolute zero. So there's really not such a thing as cold, there's just heat and less heat <laughs> until we get to this absolute zero. So really, there's no such thing as cold. Well, that's just, that doesn't make any difference. What's, well, but wait a minute, sir, may I ask another question? Well, of course. Well, is there such a thing as darkness? Well, of course. All you have to do is go out on that same Alaskan night uh, in winter. And he says, but I submit, sir, but that's really not true because, you know, we can measure light. 
you remember from the last few sermons, and we remember Dr. Quantum, and we looked at Dr. Quantum, and light can behave both as a particle and a wave. Oh, very good. You know, uh, oh, Dr. Quantum did a good job. <laughs> So we can, we, we know that we can measure light and we can break it into uh, the spectrum with a, uh, with a prism. We, we know that light can be measured, but we can only go back so far. There is no such thing as absolute darkness. It's only the absence of light. And even this tiniest amount of light can illuminate the darkest room. There's only an absence of light. So then, sir, can I ask you, is there such a thing as evil? At which the professor says, well, of course there's evil. We see it in the world. Christina talked about it this morning. All the stuff that's going on in the news. I mean, we've got pedophile priests, and we've got wars, and we've got all these horrible things going on in the world. Of course there is evil. But I submit, sir, the student said, that if the same principle applies here, that there is not a, a good and an evil. There is only the lack of good. There is only the lack of God. That within this continuum there is only good and not now in our philosophy we don't believe that there is a lack of God we believe that God is all there is to our songs once again well, we could just sing we wouldn't have to do it <laughs> there is only only good and that we experience something on this spectrum in between. So really, there is no evil, there is only good. Now, in our philosophy, we don't believe that there is that there is no place that God is not, that there is not a less God or anything else. It is our awareness of the presence of God. There are times that we are not aware of that divine presence, and that is the separation of which we speak. Example. I think we have time for this. This is, you know, I think most of you know I, there is a joy in my life now, and <laughs> she's had a couple of pretty good days. Uh, you know, she hasn't had any accidents inside, and uh, she's always been really good at coming. You know, joy coming. Man, she is there. Tail wagging. She is a happy girl. Um, and this morning she was great. She got up, she went potty at 5.30. You know, she hang out with me for a little while and I fed her, life was good. You know, we're, everything's going and then. You know, I was beginning to doubt that whole devil thing. I swear, she turned into the... <laughs> she was horrible. I mean, she got into the trash and had it just strewn throughout the... While I was picking up the trash, she got into something else. I mean, she was continually... And then she started nipping at me. I'm down on my hands and knees cleaning up and nip, nip, nip. Uh, get away from me, Joy. Joy. <laughs> there was anything but the presence of God in that moment, I can tell you. So I finally got her quieted down. She, peace, joy's being good now. I'm going to jump into the shower really quick. I jump into the shower. I was only in there a second. I came back out, stepped out of the bathroom, and squish. <laughs> bare feet and she peed right in front of the door. And there she was sitting in my meditation chair <laughs> grinning and wagging. She wasn't big enough to get up there yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and within that, and within that, what I realized when that little girl looked up and was so happy to see me I'm thankful that she is such a rambunctious little girl and she's willing to do all this. <laughs> Maybe not all of it, but <laughs> the day will come when she's not going to be 
know her favorite trick. You cannot let her in the bathroom. She grabs the end of the toilet paper and zoom through the house. And if it breaks, she knows enough to go back and get the part that's attached to the wall and take off again. And she will toilet paper the whole house. She'll give up on that someday. I know she will. And then beyond the appearance of a toilet papered house, there is an active, loving little puppy. <laughs> Which leads us directly to the second point. Say what you believe and believe what you say. <laughs> the problem is presented as this. If God is in all of everything. If we talk about the presence of God is in, through, and around all that is. If God created all that is, the presence of God is within all of everything. Where is God in all of the aforementioned news articles? Where is God within the pedophile priest? Where is God within the wars? Where is God within child slave labor? Those are sticky questions, and those are more the questions that come up in foundations class. Where is the God within cancer that robs us of our loved ones at such an early age? I have my own beliefs on that, and one of the things in Foundations class that I think is so awesome is we invite people to think for themselves. I'm not up there to spew some sort of dogma that everybody is supposed to memorize and follow, but we encourage people to think for themselves. I would give five big sort of areas that I kind of uncovered. I know there's more than that. Reasons to explain how these things can happen if we do believe in an all-powerful and all-present loving God. So how does that exist? First, oh, there's actually five of them. There's two of them that I really don't believe at all. There's one that's kind of a iffy, and then there's two that I do believe. <laughs> Number one, that we are not capable of understanding. We're, we're just, we're just not smart enough. We, we can't get it. Number two, God made some kind of mistake. Well, if this is an all-knowing, all-powerful God, how could he make a mistake, or she make a mistake, or it make a mistake? I don't buy either of those. Another one is, it's only our judgment that this situation is bad. It's only our judgment that this war is bad. It's only our judgment that these pedophile priests are, are bad. And that I don't know. Atten's got a... There are some things that I absolutely agree. They are cultural. You know, cannibalism. In the United States today, we don't look favorably upon cannibalism. But there have been societies and there have been things throughout the history of mankind where cannibalism was a perfectly accepted way of being. Depends kind of on the culture. Or even a little bit closer, pork. M many people eat pork today. There was a time, even within Christianity, a time within, certainly within the Abrahamic tradition, that the consumption of pork was forbidden. It was, it was just, it's the way it was. It was the teachings of the time. And pork was not, you know, you didn't eat pig. But that didn't necessarily mean that you were gonna, that it was die. It was a, a judgment call that you shouldn't eat pork. Now a fourth uh, explanation for this is that sometimes we don't see the entire story. We don't see the big picture. That there's more going on and we don't see every facet of that. And the example that I use for that is, and it's another old, old story. I believe it's a Hindu story. Uh, India, um, there was a village and it had, I believe, six blind men in this village. And it came out that one day they were going to have an elephant visit the village. And all the blind men were really excited. You know, they had you know, heard of an elephant, but they didn't really know what an elephant was. And they were all excited about this, being able to experience an elephant. So they were all excited and finally the day came and the elephant came to town 
town and the six blind men went up to it and you know one of them put his hands up and he felt the side of the elephant and the other one went up and he felt a leg the other one he was in the back he got the tail of the elephant I'll go there. Another one, he, he got the tusk, and he felt the tusk of the elephant. So all six of them got a different part of the elephant. And they finished their day, and they thought, oh, this elephant thing, it is the most amazing thing in the world. The guy said, yeah, it's this giant wall, real leathery. I said, what do you mean it's a wall? He said, it's like a giant fan that was blowing air at me the whole time. What? No. You guys are both wrong. It's like a giant tree trunk. It was this big, round tree trunk looking thing. No, each one of them had a different idea of elephantness. And each one only saw, felt what he could feel, what he could see. They didn't see the entire picture. And sometimes we're like that. We're only seeing the tail of the elephant. And sometimes we're at the back of the parade with a shovel. I don't know. That's not part of the story. But we only see part of the picture. And sometimes some things that we see that may not be good for us may have a great effect at a different time in a different place for somebody else. You know, I think we can look back at some things in history, you know, and who knows what would have happened had things been differently. What would have happened had Abraham Lincoln not been assassinated? You know, we don't know, and sometimes we don't see the entire picture. And then finally, the fifth reason that many theologians give for this complex issue of if God has made all of everything, how could have God allowed these horrible things to happen, is that part of the beauty of all of this is that we have been given free will. And it's hard to digest, but we have been given the freedom to choose bondage over freedom. We have been given the freedom to choose poverty and lack and limitation over prosperity and abundance. We have been given the opportunity to choose disease over health and vitality. And sometimes we're making choices that we don't even realize. <laughs> We can, you know, see if somebody's drinking, you know, two quarts of whiskey a day, that their liver is probably not going to be in great shape very long. <laughs> but what about the sugars that we're consuming? Some of the chemicals that we're consuming in the foods we're taking today. Some of these things can't be good for us. But we have free will as to what we can eat and what we don't. If our thoughts are creative, then we must watch our thinking. And I'll go back to the sacred reading again. The gardener goes forth in faith to sow his seeds. He has learned that as he sows, so shall he reap. That the law works for all alike. We must accustom ourselves to the concept of the impersonalness of the law. The availability of the law and the mechanical accuracy of the law. If we can conceive only a little good, that is as much as we can experience. The law will always respond. We do not deny conditions. We don't say that there is no illness. We do not deny pedophile priests. We do not la 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 la, everything is perfect. <laughs> Ernest Holmes said, If one's blood pressure is high, a demonstration will not have been made until it is reduced to normal. To claim that someone is perfectly normal while the blood pressure remains high would be an affront to the intelligence of any sane individual. We don't deny the circumstances. We don't deny these things are going on. But what we do is we embrace a higher truth. We embrace that presence of God. 
As spiritual beings in human form, we are living in a both and world. We recognize that underneath everything is God, whole, perfect, and complete. And sometimes our human experience doesn't feel perfect. In those times, it is helpful to discover what one can believe, even if it is only a step along the way to the ultimate destination. If one is willing to consider that something might be possible, perhaps something less than the final outcome, even though for spirit, there is no big or small. If we can see beyond all of the puppy misbehavior, we can know that the truth is, is that in a few months, we're going to have that loving dog. There's an old Chinese saying, it is better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. Third point, what limits us is our beliefs. Emma Curtis Hopkins wrote, between you and your good, which belongs to you, and which you ought to have, is your idea of the absence of good. Sometimes we don't realize that we are embracing that absence of good. We're creating our own lack and limitation. The most limiting beliefs are those which lie in our subconscious. As they come to light and are addressed with denials of their reality and then affirmations of the truth, the limiting power of these false beliefs subsides. And we've talked about this the last you know, several Sundays about limiting beliefs and how we can change the neural pathways to change those limiting beliefs. But it's important that we stay on top of it because it's so easy to insist Yes, false beliefs creep back in and they do it all the time and so it is important for us to stay on top of it and realize what we're doing what I want you to take away today the conclusion watch your self talk notice what you pay attention to notice when you believe what you say and when you don't Use the power of your focused thought to transform your life experience. Again, use the power of your focused thought to transform your life experience. Notice where the light shines and look there. It is as simple and as challenging as that. <laughs> and so with our awareness of that magnificent power, that presence that is God, that is within each and every one of us. It is within each and every situation. I invite my colleagues and practitioners to join me and just simply know that there is a magnificent power in the universe. One power, one presence, one life. That life is the life of God. That life is the life of each and every one of us. And that life is perfect. So I speak my word now for each and every person that is experiencing the effect, the appearance of disease, the appearance of illness. We just simply know that there is a far higher power, a power that created all of everything, the heavens and the earth and everything on, every planet, every galaxy, every grain of sand on the beach, of every beach. That power certainly has within its ability to heal that which is diseased. And so we call forth that healing. Speak my word for those who are experiencing lack and limitation. More month than there is paycheck. We just simply know that we live in an abundant universe. Beyond this very, very real appearance of not enough, there is an abundance. And it is that abundance that we open up to. The heavens shall open and pour out a blessing. And we receive. And lastly, I speak my word for those who are feeling separation. Separation from God. The inability to see God in every situation. The inability to see God in each person. God is, I am. And so we just give thanks. We give thanks for our awareness of the power and the presence of God. 
We give thanks for the love of God. We give thanks for the abundance of the universe. We give thanks for perfect health. Now I release these words to the working of a law that always, always, always responds. We just let it go, we let it be, and so it is. So it is.